Welcome. Today's webinar will be recorded and the link to the replay can be found on Gunster's YouTube channel or on Gunster.com shortly after our session is over. Also, if you've missed our previous webinars, the first was State Senator Jeff Brandis, or the second one with Carrie Bond, head of U.S. Claims of Lloyds of America, you can find it at the Gunster.com website. Today, we look forward to an engaging conversation and strongly encourage our live audience participants to ask questions. The audience will remain in listen-only mode, but please submit questions using the questions pane on the GoToWebinar control panel. Your questions will be sent to the organizer directly without other attendees seeing them. Since our session will, since our session will be conversational style, please send them anytime. There is no need to wait until the very end. If you can't see your control panel, it may be collapsed. To expand it, click the orange arrow in the upper right-hand corner of the grab tab. I will now turn this over to my colleague and co-host, Sharon James, to introduce our guest and begin our conversation. Sharon? Thank you, Julie. Uh, as Julie mentioned, I am Sharon James. I am a government affairs consultant and attorney with Gunster, and we are very excited about welcoming our guest for episode number three, Barry Gilway, the president, CEO, and executive director of Citizens Property Insurance Corporation. Um, one of the things that we strive for um, with our All Lines webinar is to introduce participants to insurance thought leaders. Um, thought leaders and professionals that um, really have an impact on the Florida insurance marketplace. And so it was um, it was important for us to have um, Barry Gilway with us today to talk about citizens. But before we jump into all things citizens, I'd like to hear from you, Barry, and, and if you don't mind, share with us a little bit about um, your background. Um, you've been in the industry, I know, for about 50 years or so, so definitely a thought leader. Great, Sharon. Well, thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. And Sharon, it's great uh, working uh, with you in this new capacity. Uh, it was a delight before, and I'm sure it will be, be here. So uh, long history, um, you know, in the insurance business. And unfortunately, uh, Sharon is 51 years in the business. I started in 1970, and that was after a couple of years in the Army. Uh, I was an infantry platoon sergeant in, in Vietnam. But I started with an uh, insurance company in North America, and then I became a regional head for Crum and Forrester, went to uh, W.R. Berkeley uh, Corporation to acquire third-party administrators for him, went to, uh, uh, became the CEO for Maryland Casualty Corporation, uh, both uh, all divisions. Um, then I went up to Canada and then headed up all of the uh, Canadian companies for Zurich uh, 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 U.S. So, um, and then from there, ended up running a managing general agent on the West Coast. Um, and lo and behold, uh, decided to come down to beautiful Florida. Um, and I've been here for the last nine years. So I was re-reviewing your um, bio and I saw that you've been here, as you mentioned, since 2012. Time definitely flies when you're having fun. It doesn't seem like it's it's almost been 10 years uh, since you took over leadership of Citizens. So let's jump into a little bit about Citizens. Um, our audience ranges from individuals that uh, are very familiar with the insurance marketplace here in Florida to those that are outside of Florida that may not be as familiar with Citizens. So um, do you mind giving us an overview um, of Citizens, some of the background uh, and key points that we need to know before diving in a little deeper? Sure, Sharon. Uh, so, uh, as is indicated on this uh, first slide, uh, we were created in 2002, and and really it was a combination. In 1972, the uh, Florida Windstorm Underwriting Association was created, and then following Andrew, um, there was a need to create the uh, uh, Florida uh, FRPCJUA, Florida Property and Casualty uh, Joint Underwriting Association, and that was in '92. Um, and then roll forward to 2002, and they consolidated both of those entities, and then, of course, created citizens. Uh, we are um, uh, a quasi-government entity. Uh, we operate like a standard insurance company does, and based upon uh, premiums, we have our own surplus. Uh, there's only one time in our history where we've depended upon the state for, um, uh, for financial 
uh, support. Uh, we have roughly 1,200 employees, but we have another close to 1,000 uh, individuals that we work with through vendor um, uh, vendor agreements. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, we really are structured so that we have three very, very separate accounts. And we have to, from a statutory standpoint, we have to manage them separately. We have the uh, uh, personal lines account, we call the PLA. And the personal lines account is basically all of the residential policies that are not covered uh, in either the coastal or the commercial lines account. Coastal, uh, most of you who have been around, uh, uh, is formally called the high risk account. And these are statutorily defined boundaries around the coastal areas of Florida. Um, and if, it, if the risk fits within those boundaries, then um, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a coastal risk. If it's a commercial lines account that fits in those boundaries, it's a commercial risk. Everything else uh, falls into uh, the central state, which by the way, happens to be the area where we're growing, uh, growing uh, dramatically you know, at this point. So that's kind of the overview um, uh, of, of the, um, the, the company, Sharon. Uh, next slide, Sarah. So a couple of things that come out um, in terms of... I'm sorry, Sharon, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say a, a few things, um, additional things to highlight have to do with um, depopulation and the clearinghouse. Do you mind touching a little bit on that? Not at all. So the intent of, of citizens, and I say the intent because we'll get into this a little bit in the discussion, but the intent is that we become the insurer of last resort, which means we don't compete with the private market. We, we're, we are an alternative uh, for those individuals who are, quote, eligible to get insurance, but nobody in the private market will write them. So uh, we, we, we typically in this kind of condition would not compete, meaning we would not be competitive from a rate standpoint, you know, with the private market. Today, of course, that is a very different story. We're the most competitive company 91% of the time. Um, and the, the way we operate basically is the way we quote, guard the company from ineligible customers is what we call, if you refer to the clearing house. So the clearing house basically is a mechanism that was established in 2013 by statute. It consists of carriers that are interested in quoting our business to assure that before they enter citizens, there's no other market willing uh, to write them. So it has to go through the clearinghouse mechanism and get shopped to all the participating carriers before they're eligible uh, for citizens. Um, they have to meet a uh, today a 20% after SB 76, a 20% threshold. So if they get a quote from uh, any of those carriers that is uh, within 20% of the citizens rate, then they are not eligible uh, to enter citizens. It used to be 15%. Last year, that eligibility was changed to 20%. So I know as, as the, the leader, the CEO and president of Citizens uh, and a very strong advocate for Citizens, there are a couple of things that keep you up at night. Um, what are some of the things that really, um, you know, that, that you're working on that are a major focus for you and, and those things that uh, you're really looking to, to resolve? Well, of course, um, as you see in, in a subsequent slide, uh, citizens basically um, uh, really re we react to the marketplace. So the number one thing that is really driving the market um, today is profitability. Um, and uh, if you can go to the next slide, Sarah, um, the, let's talk about profitability for the market. And in order to really talk about it and understand it, you have to understand the market. So uh, the Florida domestic marketplace uh, consists of uh, about 52 carrier carrier groups, um, and they represent about 79% of the entire Florida market. Um, here's the issue. Uh, 
Um, whereas uh, in 13, 14, and 15, where we saw a lot of industry profitability, the profitability of the, um, the market in the last uh, four, five years now, four and a half years, is just, uh, it's completely unsustainable. There are uh, companies, uh, uh, we've had uh, two insolvencies, we've had three, if you include um, Florida Specialty in late 19, but we've had three insolvencies and we have other companies uh, that are in serious financial shape. Uh, on this slide alone, this just simply represents the top 10 domestic in insurers. And, and just this, the red ink means negative net income, not not negative underwriting income, negative net income. These red these these red numbers are direct hits to the bottom line of the surplus of these companies. Surplus that has to be replenished. So just a couple of examples. If you look at number one, you've got one year in 2020. That's a hundred million dollar negative net income for that company. If you look at number three. Um, num number three alone, that that company, the third largest company uh, in Florida, that's $215 million uh, negative net income. And if you look at number four, it's a $107 million loss. And uh, yesterday at the house, I presented all of the companies, all 52. And as you go through, one thing is common the consistency of the red ink. It, it is, it's just, the industry is simply a, a sea of red ink. Um, uh, there's only, I think, three companies um, that uh, in the entire 50, group of 52 that made any money whatsoever in a five-year period. And here's the issue. When a company, and this is does what keep, uh, it really drives everything else, but it keeps, it does keep you up at night. Um, when you see this kind of unprofitability, then an insurer only really has three options, right? Um, the, the first option, basically, you've got to replace this capital. So, for example, uh, if you've got a, a, a company, number two here, that, that lost $45 million through six months, in order to continue writing that same level of business, they've got to replace that capital so that their surplus to premium ratio remains within reasonable financial bounds for for Office of Insurance Regulation and, of course, the primary rating agency in Florida is Demotec. Um, but, but AM Best, Demotec, and OIR, so they've got to replace this capital. And in this kind of a marketplace, uh, who's going to provide capital when you see this kind of consistency in, in terms of overall loss? Mm -hmm. um, if you went to the end of that 52, um, if you go to the end of the 52 and you look at the aggregate numbers, I mean, what, what you're seeing, and I'll just read them off here. Um, you're seeing in 2017, they lost, the industry lost 88 million. In 18, 108 million. In 19, 312 million. In 20, 828 million. If you include the, the national carriers, 20 was a billion dollar loss, $980 million. And so far, just through six months, we're at $523 million loss for the industry. So uh, it, it's just it's just a consistent loss. They've got to, they've either got to replace the capital, um, they have to reduce their overall writings, ergo citizens' massive growth, um, and the, or they've got to raise rates. And, you know, uh, uh, OIR is placed in a very, very difficult position because they've got to maintain, help these companies maintain financial profitability, um, which means approving uh, incredibly high rate increases in some cases. But but their, their choice is I either approve, approve that rate increase or the company goes out of business. Um, they, they just can't sustain this level of loss. Um, same same way basically with the with writings. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, Sharon. You know, if you were in your own role of of a consumer advocate, Sharon, you'd be getting deluged with letters right now saying, "Hey, I've only got a 10 year old home, and they canceled me. I've I've got a 10 year old roof, and they canceled me. 
I live in, in Southeast Florida. They canceled me. I live in the Solo counties, um, you know, the Central Florida counties. They canceled me for no reason. I never had a loss. And, and the reason for that basically is um, if you can't, you've got to keep that surplus ratio to premium in, in check. So uh, if, if the question is, what is the number one issue that is driving the rest of the issues, it's overall profitability and the actions that are taken by these companies to survive. It's, um, it's, it's unconscionable, really, that, that you have a, uh, a situation like this. And, and who's the beneficiary of this? Well, the consumer. And in Florida, you know, we've, you've got incredible rate increases taking place, anywhere from uh, zero all the way up to 65% for some of these companies. Um, and then on top of that, you know, more recently, you've got flood. Uh, and, uh, you know, NFIP 2.0 and, and the impact that's going to have in some territories. So that, that, mo that most definitely, Saran, is the number one driver. And I think the importance for, for me is to get the message out. Uh, you know, Commissioner Altmaier said the, the industry's in dire shape. Well, if you were to see all five slides that I could show you showing every company, you'd see that every single company is in dire shape. Not one, not two, all of them. The consistency is incredible. Barry, let me ask you a question. What what would you suggest to homeowners that they can do to improve their insurance situation? Because you know they are getting beat up. I mean, they're getting rate increases every day. They open the mail. We opened ours yesterday. What what would be your advice? Well, uh, you know, my 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 advice. This is terrible to say, but my advice basically is that uh, there is capacity available on a very limited basis. And I'll give you some examples. So when Gulfstream just declared their insolvency um, mm -hmm. only three weeks ago, uh, they, they dropped 33,000 policyholders and, and within 30 days. They were canceled within 30 days. So 33,000 policyholders had to find coverage. Now, mm -hmm. citizens wrote 14.9% of those policyholders. So that means... Um, uh, basically that, you know, 85%, uh, right? 85.1% of those policyholders found another home in the market um, that was a better choice um, than citizens. So the first recommendation I would give to any consumer is you've got to, you've got to shop, right? Uh, and secondly, you've got to take a look, um, you know, at, at your policy form and see if there's any way to reduce uh, premiums and deductibles reduce premiums, hurricane deductibles reduce premiums, um, you know, CGL coverage reduces premiums. So you've got to, you know, make sure you're, you're uh, as Liberty Mutual says, just, uh, just get what you need and pay for what you need. Um, so I, I think re reviewing the coverage, making sure you've got the right coverage um, but making sure you're not you, you're not overstating it, and then basically shopping, whether it's to an independent agent, whether it's to some of the captive um, markets, um, uh, just to, just to see what options are available. You're not going to get away, unfortunately, from rate increases. Um, if this this picture that I'm showing you right now, if this continues um, uh, without you know, uh, additional um, change in legislation, you're going to be seeing rate increases consistently for the next three years. You're going to be looking at 15 to 20% increases per year uh, for the foreseeable future. And that, 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 that's horrible for the economics of Florida. I mean, uh, ultimately, if left unchecked, it's going to impact the, really impact the economics of the state. So Barry, I know you mentioned three options. <laughs> Um, that carriers have, and one of them is increasing rates, as we've talked about. The other uh, is moving um, or consumers going to citizens. Um, Sarah, do you mind showing the next slide? Because I think this slide is very um, illustrative um, of the, the policies in force um, that citizens has. Um, so Barry, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And how that plays into our oh, earlier okay. Yeah, as you know, as you know, Sharon, um, you've been around us long enough. We're a roller coaster ride, right? We we go up and down with the marketplace. Um, you go all the way back to the formation of citizens, and you know you have depopulation activity, and then all of a sudden you have the liquidation of Poe. You jump up higher than a kite, 
um, and then then it get the environment improves a little bit, uh, and then you go back up. You have liquidations of some carriers, and and what happens? Then you know it skyrockets from 06 to 10. We reached our peak, uh, you know, in 2011 when we had 1.5 million policyholders. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, that means we represented 23 percent uh, of the Florida market. Um, and then, of course, we we had industry profitability in 13, 14, and 15. So what happens? Well, industry profitability, everybody wants our business. So we dropped dramatically, and we were on that that curve going down. Was we got all the way down to 420,000 policies, and 108 billion dollars worth of exposure, um, and we did it within you know within four years. So what's happening now? If you look at these profitability numbers um, and the options that I laid out, <clears throat> we're starting to increase again. We started that increase with the with the uh, the uh, insolvency of Florida Specialty in late 2019, and then of course it's it's gotten progressively worse. There have been <clears throat> consent orders from from OIR that that uh, really um, have have hit uh, Southern Fidelity and uh, uh, Universal NA or United uh, NA and uh, you know and other companies. And, and those consent orders have allowed companies to cancel en masse, you know, with, with 45 days notice. And it's it's a good decision on the part of um, of, of OIR because otherwise uh, you'd have 100,000 uh, customers looking for a loss. But today, Sharon, the, the real key number I'll throw at you is today we're writing, we are increasing at the rate of about 5,000 net new customers a week. Not a month, but a week. So it, it the business is just flowing in um, to citizens. I'm I'm just so thankful we got such a phenomenal team that's able to handle it and and keep up the service standards. <clears throat> but the the growth is exponential, um, you know, in the market. So and again, just based upon my my own understanding and experience, um, would you say that litigation trends are driving um, some of the, the concerns or um, kind of talk to us a little bit about that because I know that that's something that also, you know, kind of keeps you up at night um, as you, you know, take take the lead on a number of insurance issues. Yeah, well, it, it, it not only it keeps me up at night, Sharon, uh, it gives me nightmares. Um, so if you take a look at the next slide, um, if you can go to the next one, <coughs> excuse me. So, you know, I, I roll this slide out on an updated basis every year, Sharon, uh, when I'm in front of the House or Senate and, uh, and, and anyone who will listen to me. Uh, in 2013, look at these numbers. In 2013, there, there were 27,000 property litigated cases. 27,000. Um, we will end the year. We ended last year at 85 thousand litigated cases this is the industry and we'll end this year at in excess of a hundred thousand litigated cases a four hundred percent in litigated cases um you know uh, since 2013. um yes we had uh you know irma and, and some of this you know relates to irma um and not for citizens we had very little um michael um exposure but the industry had significant michael exposure um and and the reality is we're still getting in the door this is citizens we get in 900 plus new litigated cases per month 900 new litigated cases we have a pending load over 15,000 cases and of those 900 cases 45 percent relate back to irma uh, so here we are, um, it, you know, we're way past Irma, what, four, uh, four years uh, later, um, and was, the litigation is still coming in. And, you know, I, 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 uh, I, we can go on to the next slide. I'll give you some more details, uh, you know, in terms of what's really happening. And I know this is a very busy slide, but <clears throat> I'll, I'll point to a couple of different columns. 
if you go all the way over uh, to, the, to the column that says total lawsuits, that's what I've been talking about. The overall lawsuits have increased. If you look at total AOB, what you will see basically is a consistent growth in AOB until 2019. We had 70, 60, 70 65 pass, and then uh, you know it, it dropped dramatically as a result of 70, 65 the next year. It's increasing, but and I don't have the industry numbers for this, but I do know that the increase in litigation um, for um, citizens in AOB it has nothing to do with 7065. It's all pre-7065. They're mining the claims, you know, a pri on, for pre-7065 AOB. So uh, AOB uh, 7065 did work, you know, for the industry, uh, did have an impact, continues to have an impact. But the attorneys, um, uh, I, 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 I know I get chastised for saying this all the time, but the reality is, uh, plaintiff attorneys and contractors are manufacturing claims. Uh, you're not buying a homeowner's warranty. You're buying an insurance product. And, you know, you can use all these fancy words like social inflation. Um, but the reality is it means that if social inflation is defined as the propensity of individuals to put in claims. And more and more people are putting in claims. Why are they putting in claims? Because contractors are knocking on the door of insurers, they're lined up with attorneys, they're knocking on the door, and they're and they're saying, "Hey, can I come in?" And they'll find a claim, and whether it's valid or not, they'll come in, they'll do the 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 work, and and if the company's not willing to accept the claim because it's probably phony, um, the reality is an attorney will come in, and 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 file suit. And, and under Florida's one-way attorney fee statute, um, you know, the, the, the plaintiff attorney will get paid. And yes, we made some real progress on that in, uh, in 76, uh, with SB 76, but um, it remains to be seen just how um, successful, you know, SB 76 will be. So, from a legislative standpoint, uh, you mentioned seventy six. what are what are some of the other um, successes that you all have had or and or what are some of the things that um, you see um, that are needed in the future to help improve um, what you've shown us today? well, I, I I think one of the things we haven't discussed in a lot of detail yet is is obviously citizens' rate structure. Um, we were designed to be a, a residual market, uh, a, a market of last resort. Um, the old citizen statute, and by the way, uh, a statute adopted by um, Louisiana citizens, is that the residual market had to be higher than the top five market share companies within uh, you know, any jurisdiction. And, and today, the exact opposite occurs. <clears throat> so today, we're 91 percent of the time, we are the cheapest on the street. Now, agents still don't want to place business with us because we, we pay terrible commissions. We only pay seven percent commissions, and you mentioned it, Sharon, earlier. Um, the clearinghouse. Well, if we're if we have to ask all the questions that um, 12 uh, insurance carriers um, need answered. Uh, then our application process is far more difficult uh, than than a, a normal company. So uh, rates, uh, litigation is certainly a problem, but citizens, in, in that's a market problem. Uh, a citizen's problem and our position in the market is rates, rates, rates. We, we have to come up with ways to increase rates. 76 did us, um, was, was uh, very favorable for us. You know, relative to rates, it, there were two areas that uh, that we benefited. Um, number one, part of the problem with citizens' rate structure is, you know, we were subject. To, I think it was 2009. We were subject to a glide path. <clears throat> that was an alternative to a rate freeze that existed, you know, prior to that. That started the whole competitive issue for citizens. But we were subject to a glide path that basically says. We, we cannot charge any more than 10% per insured per year. 
And every year, uh, you know, you've got some insureds in territories that are profitable and some that are egregiously unprofitable. So you never, ever get to the 10%. And the slide I showed to the house yesterday showed that, you know, our typical rate increase is, is 3.9, 5.2, et cetera. So one of the things we got in, um, in uh, 76 was the, the glide path was increased from 10 to 15 over a five year period, which was, uh, which will be ultimately very favorable. It'll be, it'll be slow getting there, uh, but it's, it'd be very favorable. Um, and the second aspect of 76 that really benefited us um, is the uh, the um, uh, the uh, uh, excuse me I'm 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 losing my uh, uh, I'm losing my thought here. So 76 is reinsurance, and and on reinsurance, you know, we're in a very very different position than the private market. We because of a 10 year we were at our peak we were writing 3.4 billion dollars in premium. And we were, you know, we got down to a low of 865 million. But during those years, pre Irma, there were almost 10 years without any major storm. So we were able to build up a significant surplus. So we we do not place the same level of insurance that a private market carrier is required to place. Um, and as a result, it gives us a a, a, a benefit because that, uh, as you know, the the rate for insurance gets passed on through the rating algorithm, you know, for these companies, they can pass on that rate to their consumers. So what, what 76 did for us, it, it allows us to calculate within our rating algorithm, it allows us to calculate what we would have paid if we would have bought the same level of insurance as the private market buys. That was a real benefit. The third, of course, I mentioned before was the increase from 15 to 20% in terms of the eligibility threshold. So from a citizen standpoint, all of that was very, very good news. Um, it, it's good news because it got our rate uh, to about 6%. Um, now, when you compare that with the industry that's getting 15, 20, all the way up to 65, um, we're still falling further and further behind, um, but it's certainly a movement you know, in the right direction. And I a quick question, though: How what what can the legis looking forward? What can the legislature do to help citizens get back to charging a, ri a ri risk based rate? Sorry, that was a tough one. So the difficulty, Julie, in that is timing, right? Um, so what can the legislature do? They can implement um, the uh, the uh, the old citizen statute that basically said citizens is a residual market. Um, and as a residual market, you know, we, we, we have to charge rates that are at least as high as the top riders within a specific territory. That was a previous citizen statute prior to 2009. Um, but of course, we're, we're well away from that now. So the, the, I, I think the issue, Julie, that we're facing now, the industry's facing, not just citizens, is, is the balancing act, you know, in, in, an, in an environment where rates are skyrocketing, um, you know, I mean, really skyrocketing for these companies to keep ahead of that profitability curve. Um, is it really the time to implement that kind of a change for citizens that would have a dramatic increase in rates? Now, last year, there was a proposal that, that, that got us heading in that direction. It was proposed as part of the Brandis bill last year. <clears throat> never, never really made it. Uh, we tried to do it through OIR and, and it was not improve, approved through OIR. Then we tried to do it legislative and it was turned down in the legislature. And, that, and the proposal basically was, look, grandfather your current customers, but any new customer coming into citizens has to pay an actuarially sound rate. And why does that make sense? Well, if a customer is paying an actuarially sound rate with another company, then why we, why should we give them a competitive advantage coming into citizens, right? They should be on the same level. They should be paying an actuarially sound rate. We're not there to compete with the private market. We're there to provide a capability when the private market can't respond. So, uh, Julie, one of, one of the alternatives is just that, and that 
but again, timing, timing, timing. R right now, um, uh, you know, for any of us, uh, all of us uh, as consumers, we're just faced with, you know, unprecedented increasing costs um, in the property insurance arena, uh, soon to be in the uh, in the flood arena. It's going to hit some areas of uh, Florida very, very hard. Um, so, you know, we, we have to look at a balancing act in terms of how we get there. It's not going to happen overnight. We didn't get where we are overnight. And um, it, I think it's going to take several years for us to get back to the point uh, where, um, you know, we're in a realistic uh, position. It's going to be, take quite a while before the legislature is reasonably going to be expected um, to, you know, really pull the bandage off and, and say, hey, you're a residual market. You should be treated like one. So one of the questions that has come in from the audience um, is is relates to AOB and Barry, you you know that you and I worked on AOB reform for a number of years, um, for a number of <laughs> a really long time, and ultimately in 2019 um, there was um, some reform that took place. So the question has to do with the impact that that reform has had, um, and especially when you look at um, rates and the litigation trends and the profitability profitability trends that you've shown um kind of talk about the aob reform and how impactful that has been yeah well uh, well i i think when you go back to that litigation uh chart um sharon and you take a look at the impact we did a, a what i presented to the house yesterday was a what was a very very interesting slide um uh, we don't have time to show it now, but it's a very interesting slide because it showed you that prior to uh, two months prior to the passage of 7065, litigation went through the roof relative to AOB. It just skyrocketed. Same thing, by the way, occurred with 76. Um, a couple of months before 76 was, was passed, litigation skyrocketed. And so what happened with AOB is in the in in the two years uh, in the year and a half following um, you know the passage of 7065, AOB cases dropped. And if you go to that chart I showed you a little earlier, you'll show a, you'll show a, a dramatic drop in litigation, you know, as a result of AOB. Now what is happening? Um, uh, there are you know the plaintiff bar uh, now understands. Hey, the restrictions on new post-7065 claims are, are way too restrictive. They, they can't get around that. So what's happening? Uh, we're, we're getting litigated cases on pre-7065 cases. Now, that, that will run its course over time. But AOB did have an impact and is continuing to have an impact. But um, as was the case with Sinkhole, as was the case with AOB, um, as is the case with 76, the first thing that uh, the plaintiff bar, um, you know, will uh, look at are what are the ways to get around it? And in AOB, um, what you've seen in AOB is, well, let's turn a, 30, a third party case, uh, as in the case of AOB, into a first party case. Um, and they do. Now the attorneys have gone around the contractors directly to, uh, you know, the insurers and turned it into a first party case, which is not covered by 7065. Um, so I, I do believe AOB has had an impact. It will continue to have an impact. Um, it's a constant battle, um, you know, in, in, uh, in this state, in my opinion, the one way attorney fee statute um, is the ultimate issue in terms of returning um, Florida to any any reasonable, um, consistent, stabilized uh, insurance market. And 76 takes a step in that direction. Um, so I, I, I ho hopefully that answers uh, the question. It does. Any other questions, Julie? Yeah, I was just gonna ask you, you kind of touched on this. Um, but right now, if, if you go to an independent insurance agent, they get a 7% commission if they write a citizen's policy. Right. And I know the Board of Governors is considering either lowering that or doing away, eliminating the whole thing. Uh, what? I just want your thoughts on that. Do you think it's a good idea? I mean, what, what do you think? Well, I, I think, I think um, 
the press has been um, has quoted me uh, appropriately. Um, you know, I, I I think we have one of the brightest, sharpest uh, uh, board chairs in our history. Um, uh, however, this is an area where I absolutely uh, I I disagree with the overall assumptions. If you if you take a look at the way the insurance market works in Florida, then the basis for this market and the placement of business in this market is either the captive carriers or or the independent agent. So that's how it gets placed. It, uh, right now we're at about a 10% market share. Uh, that's up, by the way, from 4%. So we're we're 10%. What does that mean? It means that 90% of that business is placed through the independent agency system. So uh, I, I personally believe that we can support uh, some of the board and, and their position, not in terms of uh, uh, eliminating agency representation, in fact, simplifying it. Uh, TITAP is a good example, you know, a new, new quote, insure tech that's part of HCI, uh, but their, their, their solution is the right type of solution. I mean, they ask two, three questions and they make it super simple and, and, and a comprehensive process for the agent to place business. Um, so I, I think the solution for us, the way to reduce agency commissions is to reduce the amount of business we write. It doesn't go from six to seven percent to six percent to five percent. It goes to zero. So you know, on on the businesses that we're that we're placing outside. So uh, I, I I personally believe that the solution is absolutely to come up with Kelly Booten, who's probably one of the amazing executives I've ever had the chance to work work with. I mean, she's already coming up with some exceptional in term uh, uh, um, approaches to how we utilize F, the F map. Uh, facility in citizens um, that, that basically provides a, a referral system to the private market. And literally, when we go to market for a new um, uh, a, a new uh, front end system for clearinghouse, uh, we, we want to have a multi quote system so the agent can get in there any market that is willing, not just the 12 that have, uh, uh, that, uh, have, that have applied who want to participate, any agent coming in has the opportunity to quote the business and place it elsewhere. So I think the solution ultimately, Julie, is, is not, uh, and Sharon, I, I don't believe that is, um, uh, I, I think we need to do a better job for the agent in, in allowing them or supporting their access to the private marketplace. Um, we deal with 8,600 agents around the state. That's a staggering number of agents. All those agents have markets available to them. And our, uh, the secret sauce for us has to be, how do we work with those agents most effectively, you know, to get them to place business elsewhere and not with us? Some of the other things we've talked about will certainly help. But in terms of the overall distribution strategy, um, you know, uh, that's, I, I don't believe it's the right approach. I, I, I think uh, the time has not yet come. I do believe the insure tech approach as applied by TITAP, for example, um, is, uh, is the way of the future. Um, but I don't believe uh, that uh, eliminating uh, the independent agent, an independent agent today, by the way, they don't make any money on citizen business. You're not gonna make any money given our front end systems, you're not going to make any money at 7%, zero. I guarantee you it'll take you four years, five years um, um, of, of renewals in citizens to even break even. Um, it, it's just not economical to, to, to place business with us, but the agents have to do it if they got no other choice. That's true, that's true. Well, it looks like we're coming to the end and we want to thank you so much. I mean, we knew this was going to be an engaging conversation and and you've done a wonderful job explaining it and, and letting us know what's going on. Um, we do not have our uh, next month's webinar. Um, or do we, Sharon? I, I guess we know it's going to be in November, November 12th, 13th. 
So, so we'll share the exact um, date, but we are excited to announce that Representative Fentress Driscoll will be our guest for episode awesome. four. Um, we led um, our initial webinar series with Senator Brandis, and so we look to not only hear from insurance thought leaders, but policymakers that influence um, the insurance marketplace. So we're excited to have Representative Driscoll with, with us um, for the month of November, and so you'll be receiving an invitation uh, and date and time very soon for that. So again, Barry, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we will definitely look forward to the legislative priorities and agenda that Citizens rolls out in the days and weeks to come. We'll follow and monitor that very closely. Um, but again, thank you for your time uh, and your leadership. Julia, there's nothing. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.